way There stands a white man just to take it away Some might say, I talk loud, see if I care Unlike them, don't walk away from my fear I'm busted bones, broken stones, look the devil in the eye I hope he's gonna break these chains, oh yeah The devil's gonna make me a free man The devil's gonna set me free The devil's gonna make me a free man The devil's gonna set me free Another hard day, no water, no rest I saw my chance, so I got him at last I took his six-shooter, put two in his chest He'll never say a word no more He'll never say a word no more The devil got him good for sure Ain't got no place to call a home Only chains and broken bones Got no place to call a home So come on, Lord, won't you take me now? Ain't got no place to call a home Only chains and broken bones Ain't got no place to call a home So come on, Lord, what you waiting for? Good morning, everyone. Nice to see you. We start the service today like we start all of our services with the ringing of a bell. The bell reminds us that we are in relationship uh, to a wider community than just here and just in ourselves. The first bell that we ring is to bring us back into a sense of relationship with the history of this place. We are on the unceded land of the Mwakma tribe of the Ohlone people. Their land was taken from them. Their customs and culture were uh, destroyed or suppressed. They are asking us to be in relationship with them that we might help to restore some of that culture that the ideals and uh, dignity that they uh, sewed into this land uh, might be something that is honored. So we ring this first bell for them. The second bell calls us into relationship with ourselves and one another to recognize the promise that we live out together and to make sure that all of those promises remain unbroken. So we intentionally gather and be present with one another 
so that um, the relationship that we have will become beloved for everyone. And the third calls us into relationship with our children and our children's children out to the seventh generation, reminding us that what we do today or what we fail to do will be felt by those who come after us. Good morning. I like the <clears throat> I like the quote from Fred Rogers that uh, showed at the top of the order of service. The quote was, "If you only could sense how important you are to the lives of those you meet, how important you can be to the people who may never even dream of, there's something of yourself that you leave at every meeting with another person." And that was uh, Fred Rogers. In my ministry, I've learned the truth of this statement many times. I'll give you a couple of examples. One time during my internship as a minister, on one Sunday morning, people were getting ready for worship and bustling around, and there's a woman who I had uh, met and I know who, who I knew struggled with anxiety issues, came up to me frantically saying, I'm so anxious, I'm so anxious, I don't know what to do, please help me. She was so frantic, and I was, you know, brand new uh, intern, <laughs> thinking, oh my gosh, what can I do? And so I suggested that we go uh, out of the busy hallway, and we sat down in the library, which is no one else was there, and I closed the door, and I sat there holding her hand, and I was thinking, what can I tell her? Oh my God, well, I have no idea, just no, nothing that I can do that, that, that can possibly think of that I could, that could help her. I'm going to be a failure as a minister if I can't think of anything to help people. And so that's what I was thinking. And I sat there holding her hand. And after a couple of minutes, no words being said, she turned to me and she said, I feel so much better just being here with you. What a lesson for me. What a gift. You know, um, really, my presence and not, nothing that I said or anything, just be a caring person quietly sitting with someone was enough to bring her anxiety level way down. And so that was really a lesson for, <clears throat> for me. There's another example. Uh, you all know that I work in, you may know, some of you, if you know me, <laughs> I work in a mental health center, um, and there was a woman uh, who was a, a longtime client of ours that had come there, and she uh, was really having terrible struggles and just uh, having having problems keeping it together, and so I um, sat there and, and listened to her. And I knew that in the past when she had had struggles that going to a hospital, the mental hospital was helpful to her. So I asked her if she thought that um, it might be helpful for her to go in the hospital again. And she said yes. So I took her to the hospital um, and sat there with her, helping her fill out the forms that she needed to fill out and holding her hand, sitting there until she was admitted to the hospital. And a couple of, of, or several weeks later, when she was now out of the hospital and feeling much better, she came back to the art center and she said, uh, Barbara, there's something I want to tell you. Remember when you sat there with me and held my hand and sat there with me until I was admitted to the hospital, Sometimes that I think of that and it's the only thing that helps me make it through the day, to know somebody that cared that much about me. What a gift. I mean, what a gift to me. Um, and I treasure all of these things. So um, I believe that presence, human presence, is a sacred gift. A sacred gift. 
It's one of the better angels of our nature, or maybe even the better nature, <laughs> angel of our nature. So come, let us be present with each other and worship together. So we will start in with a chalice lighting. So um, please join with me in reciting these words, which call us together as a community and with Unitarian Universalists all over the globe. We light this chalice to remind ourselves to keep all people happy because we are all one planet. To take good care of the earth because we are home in full of goodness and love because that is how we will become the best people we can be. Good morning again, everyone, both here and online. Welcome to Mission Peak Unitarian Universalist Congregation. My name is Gail Tupper, and I'm a member of your board. We are so glad you've joined us here this morning. Our Unitarian Universalism is a radically inclusive, open-minded, and open-hearted faith. We are people who are coming at truth from different paths. We use chat in Zoom or on our book near the welcome table over here to share our joys and concerns, personal milestones of importance, which will then be read aloud during our service. Maybe you're here for the first time. Welcome. We've been reaching out and asking people to bring their friends because we think the world, especially now, needs some friendly places to gather and find encouragement and hope. We have social hour after the service to visit with one another in breakout rooms or on our patio. The worship host will give you more information about this immediately after our service. Then I will shortly put a link to our weekly newsletter in chat so you can see the events coming up. We encourage you to join anything that speaks to you. We also put our welcome email, welcome at mpuuc.org, to request a newsletter or other information be sent to you. Yes, I do have some information to call your attention to, also known as announcements. Uh, for those in person, please remember to silence your electronic devices. You're welcome to join us at Mission Peak UU's outing to Fremont Museum of Local History on Sunday, April 23rd, that's next Sunday. Second, we are all having, we are having a children's chapel on Sunday, April 30th. More information will be available on all of these things on our website. We are recruiting for new leadership positions for the upcoming year at Mission Peak, which means starting on July 1st. It really isn't scary to get involved, so please ask board members about their position and what it entails. I'm currently the secretary and will be happy to talk with any of you about that specific position or about being on our board in general. Also, we are wrapping up our annual canvas, so please respond to Valerie or Suzette if they contact you. There's a budget planning meeting this Tuesday and we can't develop the budget if we don't know how much money is being pledged. So now's the time to follow up on this. Thank you. Also, we need more folks to help with our Sunday services set up, aesthetics and greeting. It's really a great way to connect with more people here and an incentive to come in person to do this service to our community. And if you're interested, contact Don Ramey, who's here. Wave to everyone, Don. He says, it's fun too, and yes it is. <laughs> Remember, if you hear something in this morning's service that inspires you or makes you laugh or brings you hope, please share it. We need you to help start a wave and love of love and justice with every gathering. And let's end by asking everyone in Zoomlandia 
and everyone in Cole Hall to wave to one another and feel the joy of being one large to beloved community. Welcome and thank you to our dear members and friends near and far. We are blessed to have the music of Peak Rocks this morning to lead us in a hymn. Oftentimes we'll stand for our hymns. Uh, Peak Rocks is, by the way, the house band. Uh, uh, oftentimes we'll stand for hymns, but this is a, uh, a hymn that is probably good to sit down to. You're still encouraged to sing. This is from Jackson Brown. It's called Before the Deluge. And in attempts to understand the thing 
so simple and so huge Believe that they were meant to live After the deluge let the music keep our spirits high Let the gildings keep our children bright Let creation reveal its secrets by and by By and by When the light that's lost within us reaches the sky Once upon a time, there was a family. That family lived in a house with a kitchen. That kitchen had many dishes, plates and bowls and cups, mostly made of pottery. Those dishes got washed in the dishwasher and put away in the cupboard. As the children in that family grew, they began sharing the work of daily chores and the task of emptying the dishwasher fell to them. As it would happen, sometimes when the children were putting away the dishes, there would be an accident. Sometimes those accidents were small and left the plate chipped, but still usable. Sometimes the accidents were bigger and left the dishes too damaged to continue being used. Have you ever broken a piece of pottery? Have you ever found a way to put it back together so it could be used again? Many of us know about the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle. There are several more R's we could add to that list. One of which is repair. For many years, Japanese artists have been using gold and lacquer in their art. Some of them started to experiment by using those supplies to repair breakin', broken ceramics. The word for golden in Japanese is kin, and the word sugi means repair or joinery. Kin sugi means golden repair, and it has created some amazingly beautiful works of art. It treats breakage as a natural event in the life of that thing. Simply part of the history of the object rather than the end of its useful life. In fact, the repair, instead of being something to hide or disguise, makes the piece even more beautiful. Many families have stories to tell of broken pottery. Sometimes they even have a place where they let it pile up, like mine. What if we could make something beautiful from our broken pieces? What if we collected our shared broken pieces and together made them into something new and beautiful and useful? I'd love to talk to you more about this in the coming weeks.
Our Share the Plate partner this morning is the Community Housing Development Corporation, or CHDC. It is a well-rated 501c3 group working for a more equitable future by helping Bay Area Black families purchase and keep their homes through down payment assistance, closing cost assistance, and financial management education. Here is a statement from Darylin Swift of the CHDC to explain their work and why historically it is important. CHDC, for more than 32 years, we've been committed to making consistent and intentional efforts to create communities where people can thrive and to dismantle the inequities in the housing infrastructure by building communities for low income and often disadvantaged. We're also raising the conversation and making an effort to close the racial wealth gap. For Black Americans to become economically healthy, first it's important to understand the systemic barriers that have put us at a disadvantage and how the efforts of Black families trying to build wealth have been blocked. Yes, it goes back to 246 years of chattel slavery. For centuries, Blacks were considered property and had no rights to build wealth. 4 million formerly enslaved, which was 90% of the Black American population at that time, gained their freedom. Yes, that's true. But they were freed into poverty with nothing in their own name. They owned nothing except their slave owner's name. There were efforts to help formerly enslaved become established, but there was no equity built into the process. When Blacks began to gain their own financial security, the Freedmen's Bank was started. It was started to help former enslaved save money and teach them how to use it for food, clothing, shelter, and medical care. But while other institutions were governed by oversight authorities and had insurance protections, the Freedmen's Bank members didn't have that safeguard and more than 61,000 formerly enslaved lost approximately $3 million. In Tulsa, Oklahoma's Greenwood District, which was known as the Black Wall Street, Blacks were thriving with businesses, schools, churches, and culture. But in 1921, mobs of neighboring residents attacked this Black community. People were actually deputized and given weapons by city officials to destroy more than 35 blocks in this area where they destroyed 190 businesses, they killed more than 300 people, and more than 700 were wounded. 1,200 homes were destroyed and at least 10,000 people became homeless. Property damage and real estate loss amounted to approximately $2.25 million, which estimates today to about $32.5 million. Now, keep in mind, this is one example of communities that were victimized by planned riots by different neighborhoods. Prior to that, there was the red summer of 1919 when white supremacist organizations and other ill-meaning people began racial attacks in more than three dozen cities across the U.S. There were hundreds of deaths, injuries, and yes, homes and properties were destroyed. These are only a few examples of planned attacks to make sure Blacks didn't achieve equal rights or wealth. There was also redlining. This is where federal and local governments and private sectors set up a system to be able to deny Black families from getting home loans or to stop them from purchasing homes in specific neighborhoods. You also have the discriminatory Jim Crow era, the limitations of the GI Bill for Black families and more. 
Now I'm sharing this with you because this history matters. Wealth was taken from these communities before they were able to grow and has widened the racial wealth gap. The impact is real and the families we're helping, it's invaluable to watch the pride they experience and their gratitude when they finally get a home. But don't just listen to us. Let's hear from a family about their joy in finally finding a home. My family has had the goal of becoming homeowners, but living in the Bay Area, it just wasn't attainable. We've been saving, but it seems to always be outpaced by the rising cost of homes and the down payment money we needed until now. Last year, we got a $10,000 down payment grant from Community Housing Development Corporation's Black Wealth Initiative, and now I'm a proud homeowner. I can't fully explain what it means to us. And when I saw the joy on my children's faces when I told them this was our permanent place to live, I got a little choked up. My daughter actually cried. She said, this is for me? And of course, I cried too because I realized that my children will see me providing in a way that my parents weren't able to. And I'm hoping this leaves them with a blueprint to do the same and pass the wealth of home ownership onto their children. So we're partnering with CHDC because inclusion and equality are part of our core values as a faith community. You can help make a contribution toward this worthy endeavor by mailing your check to Mission Peak UU Congregation at the address on your screen. You can also use the bill pay option on your online banking or drop a check in the Mission Peak mail slot. You can pay online or with credit or debit card. Thank you for supporting and sustaining our efforts in the larger community. Your contributions make loving, learning, and leadership more possible. And thanks also to Daryl and Swift of CHDC, as well as uh, Kathy Bain and uh, Barbara Myers and Michelle Wallace on our Aero team for being the liaisons for us on that. The thing that gets us through in the hard times and in the good times is the spiritual sustenance that we bring in our brokenness, sometimes we all need repair, like Ariel says, and we provide that by showing up and being present for one another. We are the spiritual kintsugi of community. We create the gold of what brings us together, whether it's to help bear sorrows or to help celebrate joys. If you have a joy or sorrow that by sharing with this community might bring hope or healing, we encourage you to um, if you are online with us, to write it in our chat. If you are here and present, we have a book uh, over there which you can share your joy and, and sorrow. Uh, if you would like to uh, share a joy or sorrow silently, uh, we're going to play some music and we invite you to come up and you can drop a stone uh, into our stone garden. If you have a joy or sorrow that's a little bit more personal and you'd like a conversation, uh, Barbara and I are available for uh, conversation. Um, just let us know. Great to have you here today. In times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me, speaking words of wisdom, let it be. And in my hour of darkness, she is standing right in front of me, speaking words of wisdom, let it be. 
let it be, let it be, let it be, oh let it be. Whisper words of wisdom, let it be. And when the broken hearted people living in the world agree, there will be an answer, let it be. Still a chance that they will see There will be an answer Let it be Let it be Let it be Let it be Oh, let it be Yeah, there will be an answer Let it be Let it be Let it be Let it be and sorrows that are in our heart this week. A tremendous joy from Kathy and Steve Walcave that Sarah, their daughter, and uh, Matt's baby was born yesterday. And they are uh, running quickly after the service over to the hospital to uh, meet for the very first time their new grandson, Remy. Gail Tupper has a joy uh, that she is celebrating her final oncology appointment, yes. which was last week. Uh, that was the five-year checkup after she was diagnosed with a rare and aggressive cancer. And she just asked all of us to remember that if you have symptoms, see your doctor right away. It may save your life. It saved hers. There is a joy uh, from Erica Kusterman that uh, she spent two wonderful weeks in Hawaii with George. Uh, and it was, it's great to be home again. She missed her dog and we missed you. Uh, and a wonderful uh, joy from Don, uh, who uh, helped his younger brother, Jerry, celebrate his birthday. Uh, lots of joys in the community. 
uh, a joy from Julie Ganslin for 24 fabulous years together. I'm assuming that she means with Steve. 15 years ago today, they made it official and they put rings on. Uh, appreciations from Annette Bringen uh, for the lovely flowers from Mission Peak and for all of the care and sympathy uh, at the passing of her father. Uh, tremendous joy from uh, Allison McDonald uh, to have their son, Greg's family, there last weekend. It was disappointing that um, the entire household seemed to get sick with COVID, but they're grateful for vaccines and Paxlovid. Um, and she and Graham are both doing better, but still not 100% uh, yet. Uh, a tremendous joy from uh, Callista, who is with us again online this morning because she now lives in California. We're so excited to have you back, Callista. Uh, let's see. Um, a concern uh, for Ingrid Ju, who asked for prayers for her midterm exams that um, we can somehow facilitate getting good grades. We will do our best. Um, a joy from James Imsky that he got promoted at work. I hope that promotion means that we get to see even more of you. Uh, a, uh, an appreciation from Valerie Stewart for all the good wishes uh, in her and Rich's recovery from COVID. Um, uh, tremendous gratitude and well-deserved from uh, so many people uh, about the music of our house band, Peak Rocks. Um, that is a, just a tremendous effort that they put. I, I, I'm on the email chain, so I see how many tracks they have to do and put together. It's just really lovely. Uh, tremendous joy for me personally. Uh, this morning I was surprised by a very dear old friend, David Biblin, um, who I knew since we were 14, 15. We spent an awful lot of time listening to music together and reading comics and doing a number of other things I won't tell you about. but. Uh, Great to see you. Finally, let's uh, join together in the spirit of prayer. There was last night another mass shooting, this one in Alabama. Four dead, many others injured. The US has suffered 162 mass shootings in the first 15 weeks of 2023. That's one and a half per day. Like Alabama state officials, I ask us to pray. But unlike those officials, my request is a little different. I don't want you to pray with your thoughts or with your compassion. I want you to pray with your feet and your voice and your outrage. I don't want you to pray after each shooting for the victims who were killed. I want you to pray for the countless more who are held hostage by the unconscionable refusal of officials to stand up to the gun lobby. And I want you to pray every morning in calls and letters to your elected officials in vocal opposition with your neighbors. I want you as Paul said, to pray without ceasing to all who will listen until our prayers uproot the toxic greed and corruption and lethargy and inaction. Remember, justice is never given. It is always demanded and taken. Let our prayers transcend meekness and become a commanding and resounding voice. And may there be no doubt that it is love's voice that we speak for and with. 
but a love that is done being polite. Finally, one last stone for all of the hopes and hurts still too tender to escape our heart. May for the sake of love, we keep our doors, our hearts, our minds, and our arms open. I started this reflection just with a simple question. How do you know your religion is any good? I mean, haven't we all met someone who seems really mature and wise and compassionate and humble and selfless, who claims absolutely no allegiance to any organized religion? And we've all seen people who are pretty vindictive and selfish, despite being devoutly religious. On Easter Sunday, I had a conversation with someone who was struggling with their religion, with their spirituality. We talked about spirituality and spiritual growth. What prompts our growth and evolution? What keeps us from growth? I shared a brief synopsis of James Fowler's stages of faith. James Fowler, if you've never heard of him, is a professor of religion at Candler School of Theology in Atlanta in the 70s and 80s. He wrote a book called Stages of Faith that became industry standard for faith development, much like Maslow's hierarchy of needs became the psychological standard. Fowler posited six developmental stages of faith. And I, this morning, am going to quite criminally reduce his 30 years of work into about 25 minutes. Uh, I hope that does not lower me on my stages of faith. The first stage is what Fowler called intuitive projective. It is the stage of preschool children in which fantasy and reality get mixed together. In this stage, we are completely dependent and in awe of those figures who give and protect and support life. We project divine associations upon them. Later in life, it is common that a person's understanding of God can be traced directly back to characteristics personified by those early caregivers and authority figures. The second stage Fowler calls mythic literal. By the time children entering school, they begin to mentally organize the world through action consequence lens, the beginnings of logical sequence, if then. It is in this stage we begin to recognize that parents and care caregivers are not in fact gods, but they remain godlike in our minds, for they determine the order or the lack of order in the world around us. Many lasting associations of God are formed both good and bad in this stage. Although most people, as they emerge into adulthood, grow out of this stage, some do not. And it is not uncommon to see such people in all walks of life, teachers, law enforcement, clergy, politicians, remain firmly in this stage. In this sermon, I want to explore the remaining stages against a backdrop of cultural evolution in our country. But for now, I pose this question. If we move beyond this stage or any stage, what is our obligation to those we encounter in the stages below us? Contempt? Ridicule? judgment, pity, and how do we invite and encourage those to continue on their path of spiritual evolution as we continue on ours?
vengeance was theirs as they bellowed for justice. Death to the man who has sinned against God. The presidential election of 1860 was a contest of ideologies, and in particular, two ideologies would be decided. One was the fate of slavery. The other, closely related, was who would be empowered to decide such a fate, the nation or the states? Four stances emerged in the election. They were roughly represented whether slavery would be accepted, integrated, tolerated, or outlawed. 
The Republican National Convention nominated Abraham Lincoln, a moderate who was not quite as stringent as the abolitionists wanted, eliminating slavery, but not quite as lenient as the Southern states demanded. Lincoln supported the Constitution, which allowed slavery in states which, in which it already existed, but opposed extending it to new territories. Lincoln hated slavery, but he wanted to save the Union, which was divided. He campaigned to avoid secession of the South from the North, and if secession was inevitable, to avoid war but neither of those goals was possible. The election was fiercely contested and geographically divided with unity of Northern states opposing unity of Southern states. California being a new territory which had just discovered gold at this time was relatively undecided and critically important not for its electoral votes, but for how it had the power to tip the balance of undecided moderate beltway states in between the North and the South. Lincoln won the popular vote and the electoral count. California was like the Kintsugi keeping the Union together. Lincoln credited the tireless and influential campaigning of popular Boston Unitarian Universalist minister Thomas Starr King, who had just accepted the pulpit of the San Francisco Unitarian Church. But immediately after Lincoln's election and before he was inaugurated, seven southern states announced secession from the Union. War seemed inevitable. Lincoln vowed that he would not start the war, but he would take it up upon, if fired upon. Four more states would then secede, and it was the beginning of a social, political, and spiritual war that would run right down the center of the country's identity. The third stage in Fowler's development of faith is what he calls synthetic conventional. He likens it to us as teenagers who step away from our tribe and need to claim our own way of doing things, our own faith. But we often adopt a very close version of what we had been taught as faith in our early years. But new faith is fledgling and needs a social circle of supportive, like-minded people. Needs for solidarity make it difficult to entertain any new ideas outside of the group perspective of which you're a part. At this stage, authority is transferred to individuals or groups um, that represent one's beliefs. This is a stage in which many people will remain for the rest of their life and indeed become willing to die for. In his inaugural address, Lincoln pleaded with 11 seceding Southern states. He said this, we are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained us, it must not break the bonds of affection. The mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land will yet swell the chorus of the Union when again touched, as surely they will be, by the better angels of our nature. But sometimes our better angels are elusive. When the 11 states forming the Confederacy fired upon Fort Sumter, those better angels went into retreat. The Civil War was fought in 10,000 different places in this country. More than 3 million Americans fought and more than 650,000 died, which was 2% of the general population of this country. In two days at Shiloh, on the banks of the Tennessee, more men fell than in all the other American wars combined. At Cold Harbor, 7,000 Americans fell 
in 20 minutes. Men who had never strayed more than 20 miles from their own front door found themselves hundreds of miles from home. They knew they were making history. Many knew that they were determining the heart and the soul of the nation. Few stopped to realize it would only come from the breaking and reforming of the heart and soul of this country and every individual who made up the country. Hundreds of reports told of battles fought so close together at night that the two opposing camps could hear the singing and praying coming from the other's campfires, each beseeching their gods, believing they were on the right side of the divine ordination of things. In great contests, Lincoln said, each party claims to act in accordance with the will of God. Both may be, but one must be wrong, as God cannot be for and against the same thing at the same time. It is a difficult thing to change, to question any entrenched ideology or faith that we have, even when there is good evidence that we may be wrong. Photography was fairly new in the 1860s. Matthew Brady, who you may know as a famous photographer, um, rose to prominence at that time as a portrait artist. His work helped Lincoln get elected as he was the first candidate uh, to turn to marketing his image rather than going out on the election circuit. But Brady felt the obligation of this new innovation to tell a story, to tell some truth. Sensing that truth was being revealed in every battle, he took thousands of pictures of the war, not only of the generals, but of the people fighting back home. He also told the story of less noble subjects the tragedy and torment that brought humility and broke hearts on both sides. The people back home had depended on the papers and letters from loved ones on the front, but Brady provided a new means of accessing this truth. And the people seeing this truth didn't always like what they saw because what they saw changed them. The fourth phase in Fowler's stage of faith is called individualative reflective. And this is a painful stage, often beginning in young adulthood when people start seeing outside the box and first realize that there are actually other boxes besides their own. They begin to critically examine their own beliefs and often become disillusioned with their former faith. Ironically, stage three people usually look at stage four people as becoming backsliders, when in reality, they're actually moving forward. This incidentally is the stage that Unitarian Universalism thrives upon. We are a denomination of backsliders, of people from other faiths. Those who become disillusioned by the hypocrisy or short-sightedness of their past pursuits, but who still feel the pull towards something more meaningful. People who search in a critical way, willing to use reason to deconstruct what no longer makes sense to them, right? But, it's easy to get stuck in stage four. And there are congregations all over our denominations with stage four stuck people. We have to remember that there is more to spiritual evolution. To move beyond stage four requires not just taking things apart and declaring what isn't true, it requires us to show up in the brokenness of the world and the lives that make it, to show up with the presence and humility and compassion that Barbara talked about, 
to say what is true to help put things back together again. The Civil War carried on for more than three grueling years with an average of 450 Americans dying per day. Tolerance for the sacrifice and suffering was taking a toll on everyone, but especially on Lincoln and his chances for reelection. Early battles, especially in Virginia, close to the capital, were largely won by the South thanks to the brilliant strategic command of Robert E. Lee. The Confederacy was trying to draw England into the war by forcing it to recognize Southern territories as a trading partner. England was struggling because the South was its major source for cotton and textiles, but Lincoln knew that England had 20 years earlier outlawed slavery itself. So he reversed the position on which he had run for office, allowing states owning slaves to continue owning slaves, and he introduced the Emancipation Proclamation, freeing all slaves, which then put England in an ideological bind. But it also increased the South's loathing toward him and, toward, and started his own party to start casting about for a more electable candidate. Lincoln knew the Union could not likely be saved without freeing the slaves, and it might not be worth saving unless they were free. He hoped for more people to share his feelings about this, and there were. On the night Lincoln signed the Emancipation Act, 161 years ago today, prominent Unitarian abolitionists William Lloyd Garrison and Harriet Beecher Stowe stood next to Frederick Douglass in a Unitarian church and wept as they listened to the testimony of an escaped slave. Finally, the slave said, they can no longer sell my daughter. They can no longer whip my sons or take my wife. They can no longer separate me from my brothers and sisters. On that night, an all black regiment broke into song as the proclamation was read aloud before them. It sounded like suddenly the voice of a choked race was loosed, said one letter home. A choir of better angels. There is an important tipping point in spiritual conversion where we not only see beyond our own original position, but we act in ways that extend our privilege beyond our own self-interests we begin to understand and accept sacrifice as a spiritual practice. Freed slaves joining Union ranks turned the tides. Not only did the desertion of labor disable the economic engine supplying the South's war efforts, but those emancipated enlisted as Union soldiers and changed the outcome of many battles and it placed an even greater pressure on the president. Rebellions and riots in New York and other large cities exposed the North's hypocrisy and prejudice. Mostly working class immigrants refused to work with and share residential tenements with freed slaves. Pressured to drop emancipation as a condition of peace for the South, Lincoln refused. He said, the proclamation promised freedom. Lincoln said this as he recognized that many of the freed slaves had already enlisted and fought and died for the Union side. So he said, and a promise having been made must be kept. But that didn't stop the lingering resentment in countless passive aggressive ways that they are expressed. By the spring of 1864, the Union dead filled every cemetery possible in the North. Secretary of War Stanton ordered Quartermaster General Montgomery Meigs 
to choose a new burial site for a new cemetery. Now, Miggs was a Georgian who fought under Robert E. Lee leading up to the time in the Civil War. He had also lost a son who was killed by Lee's army. Miggs harbored a deep hatred for the officers who turned against the Union, especially hatred for Lee. Without hesitation, he picked the grounds around Robert E. Lee's personal home in Virginia for the new cemetery and ordered that the Union dead be laid to rest at the front door of the man he held responsible. Miggs' own son was buried in Mrs. Lee's rose garden. Lee's army at the time was outnumbered and surrounded. They had entrenched and enfortressed themselves and Grant sent men in to depose Lee. But Lee would kill each of those men just as quickly as they came to him. When their bodies were returned to Miggs, Miggs had them all buried right in Lee's front yard. That became Arlington National Cemetery, the Union's most hallowed ground. The fifth stage in Fowler's stages is called conjunctive faith. Rarely does one reach this stage before midlife, and it doesn't come without tragedy, without being humbled in some way. Brokenness by heartbreak and loss, by justice too slow in coming, changes us. We are forced to conclude that God is not a waiter taking our order, delivering it if we're good, nor do others control God despite the size of their egos, nor is it simply random chance, but rather it is some creative constellation of all of these. The fifth stage begins when we take up the best laid plans that have been broken before us. When we find the better angels of our nature not only showing up with spiritual kintsugi, but enough wherewithal to be present to repair ourselves and the world around us. The fate of the Union pivoted on one-eighth of the population that had been slaves and were now free. They turned the tides of the war and with it, the election. Lincoln spent his first term trying to save the Union. He planned to spend his second term trying to heal it. In his second inaugural address, he spoke primarily to the South with these words. He said, with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and all nations. On April 9th, 1865, General Grant with 150,000 troops surrounded Lee's 28,000. Lee's men remained fiercely loyal to him and preferred the fight, but Lee saw the inevitable sacrifice without conceivable gain. The two generals met at Appomattox Courthouse. Lee came proud but humbled with an engraved sword at his side saying, I will probably become General Grant's prisoner, but I thought I should make my best appearance. Grant came from the field in a private's dirty jacket. He was spattered with mud. He had no sword. They shook hands. They had fought together in the Mexican-American War some years earlier and they reminisced for a few seconds, and then Lee asked for the terms of surrender. They were simple and generous. Officers could keep their sidearms and horses. 
because it was planting season. Grant asked if Lee's men needed any rations. Lee said that rations would have the best possible effect upon his men. It will be very gratifying and do much toward conciliating our people, he said. The two men shook hands. Lee on his horse started to ride back to his army. The Union army surrounding Appomattox Courthouse started to cheer, but Grant ordered them to stop. The Confederates have surrendered, he said. We do not exalt over their downfall. The war is over. The rebels are our countrymen again. The next day, as the Confederates lined up to turn over their munitions and battle flags, a line of blue Union soldiers stood to salute them, welcoming them back into the Union. Americans welcoming Americans. It is the event in American history that made the U.S. a nation, noted historian Barbara Fields. The U.S. was obviously a nation when it adopted the Constitution, but it adopted a Constitution that required a war to settle incongruities of spirit. The war made a real nation out of a theory that had been drawn up at the Continental Convention. Historian Shelby Foote says it this way. Before the war, it was said that the United States are. Grammatically, it was spoken that way and thought of as a collection of independent states. After the war, it was always said the United States is. As that's the way we say it today without even thinking about it. And that sums up what the war accomplished. It made us and is. The surrender of the war took place on Palm Sunday. Five days later, on Good Friday, Abraham Lincoln was shot at Ford's Theater. He died the next morning, one day short of Easter, April 15th, 1865, 158 years ago yesterday. 158 years and one day later, we remain one day short of Easter. And 103 years after Lincoln was shot, Martin Luther King Jr. was also shot on April 4th, 10 days short of Easter, assassinated for having the audacity to ask people to fulfill Lincoln's promise. The work is not finished. In some ways, it may feel like we are moving backwards, but there are hopeful signs. There were over a million pictures of the Civil War Matthew Brady took that he counted on the government buying from him, but they were considered too painful to look at. Matthew Brady went bankrupt and many of the glass plate negatives of those photos were lost or forgotten. But many were sold to greenhouses, ironically, in the hopes that they would transmit a special light to help something new grow. In 1914, for Arlington Memorial's 50th anniversary, Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson brought remaining Confederate and Union soldiers back together again. Up until then, Arlington was a Union burial site. Some Confederates were buried there, but often Southern families weren't permitted on the grounds to tend to the graves of their own. Wilson opened it for everyone, and on that day, soldiers tended the graves of Confederates, and Confederates tended the graves of Union soldiers. And just five years ago, in Manassas, Virginia, where I once served the Unitarian Universalist congregation of Bull Run, something happened that I never thought that I would see. Danica Rome, 
defeated incumbent Bob Marshall, who had been in that seat in the state legislature for I don't know how many years. But when I lived there, Bob Marshall pr proudly wore the name Bigot Bob and was self-proclaimed Virginia's chief homophobe. During the campaign, he was the one who introduced the famous bathroom bill, and he personally vilified transgendered people. Rom defeated Marshall and became the first openly transgender person to win election in any state legislation. After her victory, when asked if she had anything to say now to Marshall, she responded, Bob Marshall is now one of my constituents. I never say bad things about my constituents. Friends, Although the war is over, we need only look around us to know that we are still a few days short of Easter. Easter will come, but only when we learn to take the brokenness around us and build from it a new hope. That hope may not be ours to enjoy, but it will be a testimony to future generations that we did indeed discover the better angels of our nature to the glory of life.
Every day I wake and everything is broken Turning off my phone just to get out of bed Get home every evening and history is repeating Turning off my phone cause it's hurting my chest What can I do? I can't see this in the crying. I'm not even trying to make the change I want to see. I can't sit and hope. I can't just sit and pray that I can find the love when all I see is pain. All Everybody's talking, nothing real is happening, cause nothing is new. Now when all is tragic, and I just feel sedated, why do I feel numb? Is that all I can do? And heaven knows I'm not helpless. Oh, I'm only human. I want to see, I can't sit and hope, I can't just sit and pray that I can find the love when all I see is pain, falling to my knees, though I do believe, I can't just preach, baby. can I do? Yeah, can't see the use in me crying. If I'm not even trying to make the change I want to see, I can't sit and hope. I can't just sit and pray that I can find the love when what I see is pain. I try to do the things I said that I believe. I can't just preach, baby, preach Oh, 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 oh. I can't just preach, baby, preach Oh, 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 oh. I can't just preach, baby, preach Fall into my knees And though I do just preach, baby, preach. Please join me in saying these words to extinguish our chalice. We extinguish this flame but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Friends, reach out, hand on a heart, the other out to the world, maybe on a shoulder of someone you love, maybe just in your imagination of the world that we're trying to create. Know that Easter will come, but only when we learn to take the brokenness around it and build from it a new hope. That may not be a hope that we ever get to enjoy ourselves, but let it be a testimony to our descendants that we did indeed discover the better angels of our nature.
Amen. Blessed be.